All right, welcome into the episode two of the Sideline Stories podcast with Santa Great, class of 2016, Ryan Oliver, and myself, Connor Fenling. Thank you to everyone that tuned into the first episode of Sideline Stories. Don't forget to subscribe on whatever you listen to, podcasts, or an official YouTube page. Also, follow along on all our social media accounts, side underscore stories pod on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to stay up to date with all the latest on the podcast. All right, we are very lucky to be joined today from across the world by Staten Island's finest, part of three MAC championship teams, a MAC player of the year, first in school history in rebounds, 11th all time on the scoring list, and third all time in blocks, Ryan Roster. Thanks for joining us, Ryan. For sure, guys. Thanks for having me. You know, with the, with the power of Zoom and social media, we are doing this in three different time zones. I don't know what, what we'll get into on this podcast, but. Really appreciate it. Ryan's up early down in Japan. He just got there uh, last week, so we really appreciate you waking up and getting this podcast started with us. So, happy to be here, man. Hey, we're, we're, we're happy, happy to have you. California and the other. Good to go. <laughs> we're, we're good. We're good to go. But obviously, you're getting ready to start your eighth season in Japan. Uh, what take, take us into that. You know, I know you just got there, so take us into you know, what, what your summer looked like to get to where you are right now. Summer was just uh, kind of like everyone else's. Couldn't do much. I went back to California. My brother lives in uh, LA now, so I was I was there, um, but couldn't train, couldn't play basketball the whole summer. So we started, uh, bought some pull-up Olympic rings, and we were doing workouts in a staircase in his apartment building. And uh, I'd go to the park and run, and that was my whole workout for the summer. Couldn't do anything else. When did you fly back? Um... To, to America from Japan. At what point was the season can- canceled? The season got canceled March 14th, I think, right. officially. And then I stayed here for another month, and I went back to L.A. April 14th because uh, Japan life is still pretty normal. I could still get in the gym. I could still kind of, mm-hmm. you know, get out to the grocery store where L.A. and America was already in lockdown. So it was just a better ch- better to stay here. And then uh, Japan was kind of going to lock down around April. So I was like, let me just get home now ride it out there then come back got back here last week so you're you know obviously talking about just getting back there do you see anything different with before, like in march from where it is now in japan um i mean it, it's definitely more normal here than it is at home um there's you know there's face masks are, are a normal thing here not everyone wears them but majority of the people you go on a train you go public transport a lot of people are going to have the mask on in general um so that's not really much of a change and, um, you know, there's the plastic barriers at grocery stores now and things like that. And they are a little more aware of space and six feet away. But they, they're such a polite and clean culture in the first place that it's really pretty normal. That, that's awesome. Now, when you got back out there, did you have to take a COVID test or how did that process work with testing? Yeah, I had to take one before I left um, L.A. I had to have one to send to them to show that within like 72 hours of my flight, I tested negative. And then no matter who you are, once you land in Japan, before you even go through customs or get your bags, you have to take a COVID test. So you go straight from the plane, they line you up, go take a um, saliva test. Then you go down to a separated gate. Everyone waits there spaced out and you get a number and they call your number and they tell you whether you were positive or negative. So before you do anything, you, you get a test. So, um, get your number called, they bring you up, show you a piece of paper that says negative, positive. I was negative after the flight as well. Then you go through customs, then you get your bags, and you could you have to quarantine for two weeks once you get here. So if you have a private ride and have your own house, I was able to get my manager to pick me up and then come to my house. So the only thing I'm really allowed to do right now for another week is go to our practice gym by myself and work out. Um, can't just go out and go to dinner or something like that for at least two weeks, even though you test negative. So how long was the flight? Then how long was that whole process? I feel like, I feel like that was like 25 hours right there. No, it's not that bad. The flight from LA is about 11 and a half. Um, From New York, it's 14 and a half. And I've done that side way more. So it's like LA, it's like a breeze. (laughs) You get there and then it's just hit or miss with how many other people are there. So it took me about two and a half hours to get my COVID results um, and then it's another 20 to get through customs and bags. So it's about 15 hours, then a two and a half hour trip to my, my city, my house. So it's about 17 hours of travel from get on the plane to get to my door. Um, but yeah, I've heard some people 
because of so many flights, their COVID test took six hours. Some took 20 minutes. So it's, it's really just depends who's there. So did you, uh, did you come in, did you come in earlier than you were supposed to just, you know, you know, you had a two week quarantine before the preseason started or are you guys already in preseason? The, the, the Japanese players have already kind of started their pre preseason. How it usually works is they'll do summer workouts like we do in the States, pretty much optional all summer. Um, but you know, if you're in the city, if you're home, you go. And then three weeks before the Americans or imports usually get there, they'll start their like official practice where it's just those guys are going every single day and those are mandatory. And then when we get here, they'll start official team practice. So we wouldn't, we weren't going to start that till the 24th this year. So I got here the seventh so I could be ready for the 24th and uh, make the official start time of practice. Definitely. So you're eight there. I know you, you know, you know your way around the city, like the back of your hand. Talk about how, you know, just everything from the language barrier to I know, you know, a couple, uh, you know, the language as well now a little bit. Talk about that whole transition when you first got there. When I first got there, it's tough. Um, you know, I played in France my first year and obviously I didn't know French, but at the end of the day, the letters are still English letters. So you can kind of look at a word and remember P-O-U-L-E-T, poulet, that's chicken. Okay, I'm good. I can remember that. Here, most of the, the words are all symbols and they're not the English letters, which they call Romaji, the uh, English alphabet. So it's a different set of characters. So you can't even look at the characters and think like, like there's no correlation. It's just something that looks like an upside down seven, something that looks like an exclamation point. It's like, how am I supposed to remember this? So that's kind of how it was the first time. And then you really kind of sit down and study it and break it down. And it's a lot. They have three different alphabets. They have their native alphabet, Hiragana, which is 60 characters. Mm -hmm. They have Katakana, which they use for foreign words and foreign names. So when they write my name, they'll write it in Katakana, which is another 60 characters. And they have Kanji, which is the Chinese symbol alphabet, which you I'm sure you see on like pretty bad tattoos and whatnot, where there's <laughs> over 3,000 of those. And not even all, like a Japanese citizen doesn't even know all those. So it's a lot to, to kind of digest and you're definitely a little overwhelmed. You know, being being very lucky to be on a team, you know, for four or three years with you when I was there. I know what you like to eat. I know you're, you know, you're a chicken and, you know, pasta guy. So I have to ask, you know, since moving to Japan, have you changed up what you eat? Or are you still, you know, the same old Ryan Ross here? Um, I've changed up a little bit, but for the most part, I still have my basic foods that I, I stick to and it works for me. But, um, you know, obviously you go to a team dinner here and it's, a lot of a lot of fish, a lot of meats. You kind of Korean barbecue is popular, where they bring you the meat and then you cook it yourself on the grill. Um, a lot of vegetables, a lot of things like that. So we eat really well on the road um, and any team dinner. But um, the grocery store, you can still get all the the same kind of vegetables and meats that you would get at home. You could get here, no problem. So what's the craziest thing you've eaten there? <laughs> Maybe like cow tongue. Oh. It's, it's, it doesn't really taste like anything. It's just chewy. I guess it's like what you think a tongue would taste like. It's weird. Um, but there's definitely been other stuff that I've passed on that other teammates have had. Nah, definitely. So when you pack, do you bring like def like some American snacks where you're like, I know I'm not going to get that back there, so I have to bring it from America? I don't. Um, I, don't eat, I don't snack that much as is. Okay. Uh, but then it's just like – I'd rather just go there and know what I'm getting myself into and have something for like a week and then just miss out on it. So I just, I'm good with everything over here now at this point. You know, we, we talked about this is going to be your eighth year. Uh, Tahiji Brex, I, I, I could be wrong. I think that's how you pronounce it, but. Very wrong. Well, very wrong, but hey, I'm always wrong. But, what, Brex, but then we changed our name to Utsunomiya Brex last year. So oh, you're forgiven. You got, <laughs> I'm sorry. I try to follow up as much as I can, but. You know, obviously talking about this can be your eighth year. What what about this team has kept you coming back, you know, every year for the last eight? Um, I mean, Japan as a country, they just do things right. I think the biggest issue when you play overseas that the one one or two complaints like hear about from every guy that plays overseas, no matter where they play, is I didn't get paid on time or they owe me money and the doctor didn't listen to me when I said this. And you don't have those problems in Japan no matter where you are. I've never, in eight years, I've never been paid a day late. No one I know has been paid a day late. They pay on time. They pay what they're supposed to. 
and they care about you as a person first. If you tell a trainer that your knee hurts or your back hurts or something, there's no, all right, well, we'll just ice it after practice, go play. It's uh, almost to the point where you don't want to say anything because you're probably going to get an MRI that day. So they take such good care of you that it's like, I know I'm not injured. I just said my knee hurts. Like I just need a little bit of treatment. But it's, it's that kind of thing where they take such good care of you that guys just keep coming back. And then my team in particular, I've always kind of just, if I'm comfortable somewhere um, and they treat me well and I enjoy it, I don't want to just change just to change. I think um, some people just want to say they played on 10 teams because it sounds great, but it's like if they're going to take care of me every single year and the fans really appreciate me and the staff appreciates me, I'm good. I'm going to stay here. Definitely. And how you found out about this team was essentially you had a teammate from your experience in the D League, now the G League. They first introduced you about Japan and the basketball there? Well, my agent at the time, he, co he used to coach with the Nuggets and uh, years ago. And before Hachimura and Watanabe, who were with the Grizzlies and the Wizards now, the first, the only Japanese player to ever play in the NBA was Utah Tabuse, who's my teammate now. He played for the Nuggets under this coach, under my agent at the time. So he kind of knew him. And after I played in the G League, the point guard had reached out to my agent, said, I'm looking for a big man. I can do this, this, and this. Do you have anyone? And my agent sent him my film, and Utah really liked what he saw. And he's like, oh, I really want to play with him. Can I talk to him on the phone? So at the time, I, was, I had other offers in Europe again. And I was like, man, Japan, it's so different. It's across the world. I've never been there. What is it? Is it China? Like, what is it like? I don't know. So he said, he's like, let me get on the phone with you. I'll, I'll answer any question you have. So I'm talking to Utah. I was in Albany, actually, on the phone with him. And I'm like, do you guys have, like, chicken in China, in Japan? Like, what do you have? And he's, like, laughing at me. Like, yeah, man, we got chicken. We got whatever you want. Anything you need, I'll take care of you. And he just made it sound so good. And I was just thought, you know, worst case, I go over. I don't like it. Like, Europe's always going to be there. And then uh, going on year eight now, well, I've, we've been teammates together for the last eight years. So is that is that something common on the team? Like you know, a lot of guys stay year after year. You know, obviously you get a good collection of group. You want to you want to keep as many guys as you can. But with everything, you know, playing overseas, guys go you know place to place. You sometimes don't even make it a season. So you know, staying eight eight seasons in one place is you know a credit to you. But is there a lot of guys other than you that have been there? You know, for a long time. No, I mean in terms of American players, it's probably me and one other guy right now that have done at least that have done seven to eight years on a team consecutively um like you said a lot of guys might last two months get cut go somewhere else come back play one year on this team two years on another japanese team another year there um so a lot of guys tend to bounce around um a lot so even anywhere in the overseas basketball play eight years on one team is rare yeah Typically, how many Americans are, are on a roster in Japan? What are the rules for that? It's, they've changed the rule in the past eight years a, a couple times. So it's anywhere from two to three. So this year is uh, three Americans on the, on the roster. Have you met the other ones yet? Or? Yeah, uh, one of them has been my teammate for the last three years, last four years. Um, and I played against him out here before that. Another guy is new to the team, he, but he's played in the league the last three years. So I've known him. And then we added uh, one more guy who's going to be his first year in Japan, but he's not over here yet. Yeah, you, as, you, as you talked about, Utah was like, you know, the selling force for you to get there. So when you're looking at other Americans, are you someone that they get, you know, the team puts in contact with just to talk to the guys, tell them what, it's, what your experience has been like? Yeah, I reach out right away. Um, you know, I have a good relationship with our GM and our management and coach. So if there's a guy they're trying to talk to and he's iffy and he's not sure and I think he's a good player, I'm the first one to reach out and try to sell them and say, hey, man, you know, we do things this way. It's a really good time. Um, so I, I try to be that guy since I've been there, like you said, that can answer all the questions, can help out any way they need and just kind of make them feel comfortable and, you know, get them over here to help the team. Definitely. No, that, that's awesome to hear. Um, and I feel like even the same at Siena, you, you played that similar role where you were always available when coaches needed you to talk to people. Even during the summertime, you come back and play pickup with us, like always took us under your wing and just spoke on everything and a really big help. So I definitely see that, you know, as you are doing over there. Um, like, like, like we said, you've been there eight years now. Uh, recently, you just obtained your Japanese citizenship. What was that process like and how long did it really take for it to be official? Um, it was tough. It took about 
from start to finish about two years um a lot of studying so you know you have to live here for a certain amount of time then you have to pass a written test you have to pass an oral test um you have to it's it's like going to school all over again um so like i said before with the the language and the characters it was starting from scratch i'd wake up uh every day around like 5 30 um start studying for a couple hours eat breakfast go to go to practice work out lift do what i have to do come home eat dinner study for another two hours and just repeat and because it's so different um you know going back to the characters i don't even know how to write the characters so i have to there's a specific way to write each thing so some of the studying would literally just be right picking four of the 60 characters every day and just writing them 200 times each every day just boom 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 then i have to study the vocab then the sentence structure so last summer i was here for most of the summer um and i would study in the morning by myself then i'd get together with our team translator um and he'd write sentences for me and i'd have to translate them and do a bunch of different things uh then you take a real test and you know hopefully you pass it's like college again but it's uh it's nerve-wracking it's just you and one other guy watching you take the test it's like man i need would rather be in siena with 20 people kind of hiding no pressure on you but uh, i felt like i was back in school Wow, that's I don't know if I could do that. So I, you know, a lot, a lot of credit to you. But we had we had Ron Moore last week on the podcast, and one question we asked, which we're going to ask you, I'm going to ask you personally, is, do you have any funny stories about the fans? You know, he he was talking about you know fans are throwing stuff on the court uh, from time to time, very passionate over there. Have, have you had any any unique stories about the fans? Our fans are extremely passionate, Japanese basketball fans, but in a different way. It goes back to the culture. And I said, everyone's so polite and respectful and, and enjoy. you don't have no, no team home or away. You don't get booed. You don't get yelled at. In fact, usually the, the home team will kind of sometimes sing the other team, the other teams like fight song, quote unquote, like prefixer song and cheer them on and before the game. And it's just a very polite culture. Don't get me wrong. They, they want us to win and they get upset if we don't. But there's none of that like you get in Europe where people are throwing coins at you or fireworks in the stands. Um, they're so passionate. They see you in the grocery store or something. They literally start crying, trying to want to take a picture. Like they they freak out. And that's just me. So you can imagine the guy, Tabuse, that I said, he's like the Japanese uh, Jordan. So when they see him, they go crazy. But we get a ton of gifts from fans after the game. So it's, it's really nice um, if they know you like something or – Anything, they'll give you just random stuff. Starbucks gift cards. Um, I have my tattoo. They'll give me bottles of wine with my tattoo printed on the, the label and things like that. So you just get a bunch of cool random gifts. That, that's awesome. How, about how big is the city that you're in? Uh, when, what, what city in America would you compare it to if you could? Mine's probably not that different than, than Albany, really. Uh, Probably in that sense, just related, it's it's more rural. Um, you know, we have our downtown area. There's the city. There's where the, the gym is, where we play. But I can go 10 minutes to my right, and I'm driving. And it's kind of Japan in general outside of, like, major cities. But I'm driving through, like, a rice field and a golf course on my left to get to practice for five minutes. So you could have houses all clustered together. Two minutes to the right, you could have one house every, like, half a mile. Um, and then I'm a 50 minute train ride to Tokyo. So I'm kind of, it's nice where I'm in suburban life, kind of calm during the season. But if I want to get away and go down to Tokyo for the day, it's 50 minutes and I'm there. That's not bad at all. Yeah, you, you, you talk in Albany. We, we, we see similar in the fans too. You know, the Siena fans, they don't boo at all, anyone either. So, it's, you know, I can see a lot, a lot of similar things. But talk a little bit about, you know, you did play in the, in the D League, which is not now known as the G League. Talk a little bit about how different the basketball is um, from that to, to Japan. It's very different. Um, I think I was fortunate to play in a good G D League team because uh, we only had one affiliate. So our only affiliate was the Cavs. So I think they care about it a little more. Some of these teams, I'm not even sure how it is now, but back then, especially you'd be playing the Iowa energy. They have six NBA logos on their Jersey because they have six affiliates. So it's like the Pistons aren't going to care about the Iowa energy because then the magic and the bucks and the so-and-so are going to benefit. So if you play on one of those teams, no one really cared, but we just had the Cavs and we were only an hour away from Cleveland. So they monitored the team 
pretty significantly. And I think Mike Ganzi, who was the GM at the time from West Virginia, he was such a good guy and did such a good job with the team and kind of kind of letting us know that you may think the D-League is just for you to come in and get points and get seen, but overseas doesn't care about that. If you win in the D-League and play hard, then you'll get seen. And our coach, who's now with the Utah Jazz, Alex Jensen, he did a really good job of that too, where he didn't allow any of that. I'm just going to go get 20, get, get 30 tonight. And I don't care about the team. If you didn't play defense, if you didn't pass the ball, you didn't play. And it was that simple. So I think uh, Coach Jensen did a really good job of that and made it a team game. And we had good guys on the team that, that made it fun. Um, at the end of the day, it's still the D-League. You're still getting on a flight to go to Ohio, to uh, Iowa. You're flying the cheapest route possible. So somehow you're going like Ohio to New York to like Memphis to Iowa. So you're flying from 4 to 10 a.m., playing at 3 p.m., playing the next day, and then leaving the same flight. So it's a grind, man. Do you – could you see yourself doing it for more than one year at the time? No, no it was a one and done. <laughs> I was a one and done. And, I mean, you know what you're getting yourself into. It's kind of – I think I learned a lot, so I do think it was a good experience. You play with talented players. Um, you learn a, a lot about spacing in the game if you have the right coach, which I did. But you don't want to be there for more than a year. Besides the monetary issues, it's just not worth it. You know, you know, we we all we all know what what kind of dominance you have in the paint. You know, so talk a little bit about you know how how the refing is in Japan. You know, do they get you get away with a lot of contact in the post? Is it you know something you enjoy? Have you had to change your game for that? Um, I, you know, I think they do a good job over here. Uh, I think the most important thing is they're pretty consistent. So I think Ron mentioned it the other day that you can deal with a a ref that calls touch fouls, or you could deal with a ref that calls nothing but you just want that consistency as a player so you can feel it out. It's when they go back and forth is when it's like, how am I supposed to play? So I do think they do a good job being consistent over here. Um, I have changed my game a lot. I, I rarely post up. Um, I'm way more of like a perimeter four now. If I get a rebound, I'm just going to push it and go. Um, I do a lot of ball handling, a lot of kind of – we do a lot of dribble handoff action, small on big screens. So we play a little different, um, and I've kind of changed my game now and I'm hoping the older I get I could leave all the the banging and the hard post-ups to the seven footers and just let them do their thing so what what I'm hearing is you're you're a full-time summer Ross now you know you're, you're playing the perimeter game which you used to do you know for people that don't know summer Ross was he, you know a lot of wear and tear during the season uh, playing at Siena so in the summer he was known for shooting threes and picking and popping hey which it helped you now later in your career. So that, that's, that's great to see. Very much Summer Ross right now. How much, um, and, you know, not without giving too much information for this year, but over the course of the eight years with the team, in terms of, like, the offense, you picking and popping, how much have they changed the offense, if so? And, like, are, does the team really change it year to year based on the dynamics of the team, or do they kind of have similar set values that they're going to run regardless? Um. We've kind of built an identity over the last four years that we're a very fast-paced team. Um, you know, I'm mobile. Our other bigs are mobile. So when I first got over here, I was probably playing a little more like I did at Siena, where it was like a lot of post-ups, taking open three if I had it, um, just kind of rebound and run. And then over the years, they started bringing in bigger guys over here where I'm playing against Robert Sacre from Gonzaga, who's a seven-footer who's a really good player, but I can't bang with him in the post. So I have to figure out a different way to score. So then it just started really working on my handle and, and pushing the ball. So if I get a rebound now, it's now it's become our style where it's not, I'm not going to rebound it, try to find the point guard and wait and pass to him. Once I get it, they know that I'm going to push it. So they start running the wings and I'm just going to go. Cause usually it's a guard. That's the, the first defender back. So now he has to make a decision. Is he going to try to check me on my drive? And if he does, then I'm just going to kick to our shooter. But if, or if he goes, I'm just going to go straight to the rim. And the other bigs don't want to run with me. Um, so I've kind of changed that style. We still play that up and down game. But we've, we've changed our offense a little bit. We do a lot of dribble handoffs, a lot of screen, re-screen stuff, and just a lot of space. What, that sounds like what the, game, the game you want to play now. And that's, that's the game you're seeing in the NBA, obviously, over, over here now. <laughs> You know, you got Jokic taking threes every time he can and, you know, guys like that. So it's it's something to see. But 
Talk a little bit about your relationship, you know, growing up with your brother. He obviously played Division I basketball at Davidson with Steph Curry. When you come home in the summer, you always go out, you know, work out with him. He lives out in L.A. And, you know, t your, your time at Siena, he did come whenever he had time to come help out. Talk about a little bit of that relationship. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, we've, he's two and a half years older than me. So I wouldn't say we didn't have a bad relationship when we were kids, but we had a typical brother relationship where there, there was no part of it where we were 15 and 13 and it was like, hey, Rod, come work out with me. It was like, leave me alone. And I was like, no, just let me come, let me come. So it was th that type of thing. A any one-on-one, -on -one, whether it was baseball, football, basketball, one of us ended up in tears, throw the ball at the other one, kick the ball down the street. And that was our whole childhood. Um, I think it was good for us, made us competitive and kind of made us, made us tough. But uh, it was like any brother relationship. And then once we got to college, because um, we never even played on the same team in high school, um, we played in the same team one time in his Jersey Shore Summer League, and that's it. But uh, then when we were in college and we were real serious about basketball, come home and work out together, weight room, get in the gym together. Um, and obviously he didn't play after college, but he was really into training and still is. So when I'm home in the summers, I'll train with him and he still helps me with everything. I think um, with my diet, with mobility, with anything that the little stuff that you really don't pay attention to as a basketball player, he's very into. Um, so he, he still helps me a lot. And then uh, shout out Dan Taylor as well. He's still my go-to for any sort of, hey, Dan, my knee does this when I do this. What can I do? On top of his Georgia Tech work, he'll send me a two-page paper on what I need to do. And <laughs> just dives in for you. So I know Kenny does the same with Dan and he's still the best and uh, still acts like he's our coach if we ever hit him up or anything. Nah, that's real cool. Do you think that foundation where you and your brother were able to achieve much success um, really came in from your dad playing, obviously playing college basketball as well. How much did he kind of like teach you guys from the beginning about the game? Yeah, he taught us a lot. Um, obviously he taught us the game, taught us the basics. Uh, first thing was how to box out and then kind of go from there. Um, but yeah, he uh, he always he never separated the fights or or anything like that. If one of us came in crying or kicked the ball, it was like, all right, just go beat him tomorrow, and that's that would be the the attitude. And he coached us most of our lives growing up. Um, but yeah, he played D one. My brother did obviously, and then I did. So uh, it's been nice to kind of have them in front of me, and especially Steve to kind of see what it takes uh, to be successful at the Division one level. Talk, talk about what it means, you know, you, uh, for people that know, you, your parents were at every game. It didn't matter, didn't matter where and where Sienna was playing, your parents were there. Talk a little bit about what that means, you know, running out on the court knowing, you know, the support's there no matter where you're going. They're always going to be there for you, always want the best for you. You know, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's great. Um, you know, again, like you said, Steve was playing at Davidson's. We couldn't really get to the games. He did a little bit my senior year. I got to a couple of his before I was at Siena. Um, but that's really it. But other than that, you know, our parents were at most of our games. Uh, there'd be weeks where Monday they were in Albany to watch me play. Tuesday night they were in Charlotte to watch Steve play. Thursday they were in Manhattan to watch me play. And then Friday they were in South Carolina to watch him play. So they would go to three, four games a week sometimes. And, um, again, similar to what Ron said, playing Canisius at 12 p.m. on a Sunday – you don't have to come to this game. It's, it's okay. You could stay home. But, you know, them, they enjoyed it. Same with um, Rhonda, Ron's mom. They, they enjoy it, probably seeing each other more than they even like watching us play. So it's more of a social aspect for them. Definitely. And, I mean, talk about now how it's kind of almost the opposite. You know, how often is your family able to come out and see you or your game streamed online? Is it like an NBA League Pass thing? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a league website that they can watch. Um, my brother was actually able to come out last year for the first time. He just surprised me, actually. He just showed up at my door. Um, so that was fun. But that was the first time he saw me play in Japan in uh, my seven years. So that was nice. Um, he's trying to get back over here this year, too. But uh, it's definitely, like you said, it's night and day from going to every, every game pretty much to hopefully watch online. And then my time difference is crazy. We play a lot of afternoon games. So a 3 p.m. game for me is 1 or 2 a.m. for them, depending what the time zones are at the time. Is it this – might, this might be a bad question, but is it a lot more like stuff internal you have to, you know, get up for games because, you know, 
you're just gonna, you're not, you know, your family's obviously not there, you know, the time difference, sometimes you're not going to watch it, you know, being obviously you live alone. So, you know, you're, you're kind of a lot of time, you're just hanging out by yourself. Is there a lot of internal, you know, to get up and get excited for a game? Yeah, no, it's not a, a bad question at all. Um, I think that's the difference. You know, when, when guys think professional basketball, they think like, oh, I'm going I'm to make money and I go party all summer. I'm going to do this, this, and this. You might do it for a year, but then the contracts stop coming. You stop being successful and it doesn't work that way. Like, I'm not complaining, but this is a job at the end of the day. You have to be professional. You have to take care of your body. You have to make sure you perform. You have to eat right. You have to do all these things. And like you said, we play Saturday, Sunday every week, and then occasionally Wednesday. So there'll be games where we play Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday, and one week, five games. You might be playing a team that you know you're probably going to win by 20. It's Sunday. You got a big game coming up Wednesday. You got two even bigger games coming up Friday, Saturday. And it's like, oh, man, I really don't want to do this today. But you, you got to realize that the job is you have to perform. You have to get yourself ready. So you can't just go out there because at the same time, there's – two Americans on the other team or three Americans that want to be in the position you're in and be on that better team. So they're coming at you harder than you're probably going to go with them. So you do have to find that balance between getting rest, getting yourself ready for games and the games where you just don't want to play because you're sore, you're tired, you traveled, you just have to figure out a way to get yourself going and find some sort of motivation. Nah, absolutely. Um, and it sounds like a grueling schedule, and it could be, you know, five games potentially in a week. What's like a typical non-game day, uh, you know, like an entire day for you, like morning to evening? Um, yeah, our, our schedule is tough. We play 60 games, which is by far the most. Even, you know, if you play your domestic schedule in, in Europe and then a cup, maybe hit around 50 or something like that. But, yeah, we play every Saturday, Sunday, occasional Wednesday. So if it's just a Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday week, we usually go Saturday, Sunday game, Monday off. Tuesday, once we're in season a little bit, is like an optional shooting day. So if you just want to come in and get individual work, get spots, get a workout, you can. If not, you don't have to come in. And that's also my – there's no mind games with professional athletes. There's no, oh, you didn't come to optional shooting, you're in trouble. It's like, well, is it optional or not? Because that's something that happens in college and different sports a lot. Like, just make a line and figure it out. So you got to always think about your body. But then Wednesday, a typical day would be, I always wake up pretty early. So I'm up around eight, eat breakfast, hang out. And now it's my, my morning is your nighttime. So if there's a game on or something, I'll watch it in the morning live, talk to my friends. I'll get to the gym around 1230 for a two o'clock practice. Um, hang out a little bit, get taped, start getting my warm up done, do whatever I want to do, whether it's shoot, work out before. Then we'll get into the team warm-up, team practice. And then, again, depending on how I'm feeling or if I'm lifting that day, I'll go either shoot after practice or I'll go lift in the mornings, kind of figure out the schedule like that. Come home, uh, we'll get treatment after practice, and then uh, dinner and just kind of hang out, fill my time and see what's going on. Um, there's a lot of downtime, but there's not a lot of downtime to travel. So I think that's another misconception people have. It's like – oh, you play in Italy, you must go here, here, and here. It's like, well, I get home at 7 p.m. and I have nothing to do, but then I also have to be somewhere at 10 a.m. the next day. So you can't just take these little mini trips. Um, and that's the difference. You have to kind of find ways to fill your time in small chunks as opposed to taking a two-, three-day trip somewhere because you just can't do that. Yeah. Well, you got a lot, a lot of time on your hands, but no, not, not really any time. Kind of exactly. Thing, so. Let's, uh, let's, let's change gears a little bit. Obviously, with this being a Sienna podcast, we've got to talk a little bit about Sienna. So uh, what was it about Sienna that made, made it a place for you? Coach Mack. Um, just the conversations with him were, were so genuine. Uh, obviously, he was recruiting me, but I never felt it was like, here's what you can do for me. Here's what, here's what I'll do for you. It was always just like a real normal conversation. I think half the time we talk baseball or talk something else. Um, so I was really sold on just his demeanor, his style. And I think his honesty more than anything. Um, obviously he left going into my senior year, which I wasn't happy about, but I understood. And I, it's funny because on my visit, my official visit, the last meeting we had, he said, Sienna's where I want to be. I love coaching here. I love being here, but that's not to say if Kentucky calls me year two or year three or somewhere like that, Notre Dame, 
He's like, I'm going to listen to the call and there's a chance I would leave. So I just want to tell you that now. And he told me that as a, before I even committed to Siena, which, you know, some coaches will, will just tell you, I'm going to be your coach. I'm going to be your coach. And they know they're already one foot out the door where I wasn't happy he left, but I was prepared for it. And you know how it is. There's all the rumors, just the success we had. We all kind of figured he was going somewhere. Um, I was hoping I got one more year before he left, but uh, he's always honest. And I think that's the biggest thing, whether it was yelling at you and correcting you or picking you up, there was never any lies or never any, um, you wouldn't just talk to talk, put it that way. Had you been to Albany? I, I know you're from New York, but had you been to Albany? Before? I played um, Gym Rat. Okay. Uh, I played there. We, we played uh, seven games. Talk about youth sports and health. We played <laughs> Sunday, our first game at 8 a.m. Played seven games. Finished our last game. Lost in the championship because I think we finished the game with four or five guys because guys were cramping up and just hurt. That was our seventh game of the day. And we uh, – we lo- we finished and lost in the championship at about eleven thirty at night. We were in the we were in the arc from eight a.m. to eleven thirty p.m. <laughs> that was my Sunday gym rat. <laughs> and it is funny when I was leaving campus. Uh, when I would go play these tournaments, you know, at the colleges, my mom would always say, "Like, look around, see if this is a school you'd want to go to." And you know, we've all been to Albany, been to Siena in the summer, especially summer school where there's nothing and. It, I remember my mom saying, would you want to go to a school like this? And I was like, no way. It's so boring. Like, there's no one here. And you realize it's because it's summer and there's no students on campus. But still, I was like, it's too small. It's, there's no city. There's nothing. And then I wound up going there. No, that's, that's, that's you know, that, that's why they don't, they don't want everyone, they don't have a lot of recruiting visits in the summer. You know, you want to come. <laughs> For the best. It lets you see the Times Union with fans in it. You know, it's one thing to see the Times Union with a, with the arena football, you know, field out there. So it's, it's a lot different, but talk about what the biggest, you know, eye-opening experience was when you walked in as a freshman, you know, from where, from where you, where you are now, like what, what did you learn walking in as a freshman at Siena? Um, in terms of basketball, just that I was nowhere near strong enough or in shape enough to play. Um, I think my skill was fine. But you can't use the skill if you can't keep up with the other guys on the court or physically keep up. So I remember uh, one of my earliest workouts, we were doing a one-on-one in the post. And it was just start. you could stand in the post to start there. So you don't have to go get position. You already have position. And I'm posting up and Coach Max passing. We're doing an individual. And Corey McGee is guarding me. And I'm like, blow, blow, blow. And Coach Max just blows the whistle. And he's like, stop. And I'm a freshman. So I'm like, oh, what did I do? What did I do? And he's like, look where you are. And I look down, and I'm pretty much at the three-point line. And Corey just pushed me out. And I started on the block. So all I had to do was stand still. I didn't have to get anywhere. And Corey just pushed me out to the three-point line. And he's like, how the hell are you going to post up when you can't even get that? I was like, oh, that's a good point. And I'm calling for the ball at three-point line. So I think just the strength was the biggest thing. And it's tough to really get into it during season because at that point, you're focused on the team and you, any way you can help. So my freshman year was up and down. You know, I started maybe 10 or 11 games in the middle of the season. But then after that, once we lost to Villanova in the tournament, it was like, all right, it's on. Me and DT were in the weight room every single day from that point on. And uh, we got to get the strength up and be able to play the game that I always knew I could play. Yeah, and talk about, um, you know, the practices and the battles. Like you said, um, you guys had a talented team, a talented group throughout, had huge success. How competitive were you guys in practice? Practice was fun because it's a lot of – it's not just scrimmaging, but it's a lot of five-on-five built in the way Coach Mack would do it. Um, We never just got on the line and ran. Maybe a 22 if we got in trouble. But he didn't believe in conditioning through running. He believed in conditioning through fast-paced practice and competition. So, you know, you got a guy like Kenny Hasbrook who's just a freak and who's always in shape, who loves defense, who's playing hard he's not taking a day off and he's our best player. So if he's on the court, he's going hard, which makes everyone else go hard. Ron's out there talking a lot, whether he's making or missing, he's still talking. You have Alex, who's just going to dunk on you. Same thing with Ed, Clarence, Downey is out there, depending on what year, Downey's elbowing Kenny in the ribs and they're going at it. So it is a lot of battles. Um, again, Corey was a nightmare to deal with in practice because he's just so strong and reckless uh, dual 
So we had a lot of talent, like you said. So practices really got into it, got going. But Coach Mack, I think the one thing he did really good at, was really good at and is, he didn't just beat us down to do it. I think a lot of coaches take pride in saying how hard their practices are. And it's like, you know, you could put anyone through something hard, but if at the end of the day we're only 70% for the games, what is that doing for us? So Coach always had a really good way of making sure we always peaked at game time and were rested for the games, whether that was letting the starters kind of get off the court for a little while and just get some free throws up and some shots and other guys that maybe weren't playing as much got some more conditioning. It was that style, but we were always ready for the games and we were always healthy for the games. Talk, talk a little bit about, you know, you're talking about the battles in practice and, you know, what, what a lot of people don't realize is off the court, the, those, those Siena teams you're on, everyone was best friends. You know, we, they, we hung out, we, we hung out nonstop, you know, off the court. So what was it like, you know, those battles going at each other, elbowing, and then knowing we're all going to meet in the cafeteria and, you know, be joking, you know, right after. I think that was our strength. Um, some teams you see where it's like, oh, we have, we're, going to, we're going to bowling as a team tonight. We're going to a movie. We never had to do that stuff, and the coaches never had to try to get us to do that stuff because we were already hanging out. We were already together in the townhouse. We were already at Saga together. We were already just – all of us were hanging out. There was no clicks. There was no these three guys like this, those three guys like that. It was just anyone at any time is going to hang out. And like you said, there, especially summer pickup or preseason pickup, There'll be times where there's borderline fights. If someone's calling fouls too much, Alex Franklin, um, somehow he got fouled every single play and pick up. But if someone's calling fouls, you get really angry and yell at each other. Maybe there's a push. Maybe there's something where it's physical. Next time someone drives, you get hard fouled. Walk out of the gym angry with each other. Um, two hours later, you're in Saga laughing together. And that's just how we were. And that's why, like you said, we were so successful and we were so tight. But uh, the competition was there and the desire to push each other and beat each other and pick up. And I think that does start with Ron because he'd be out there talking for you. Uh, I remember my, my sophomore year early when I kind of made a, a bit of a jump in my career and pick up or whatever, I'd just make a shot, turn around, get back on defense, and Ron's on my team. He's out there yelling for me, like, do it. He can't guard you, Ross. He can't. Like, let me, just, let me just play my game, man. But he uh, – you get everyone to that next level, I think. No, nah, I think that says a lot about you guys' team. And, and even now, you know, like how, how close you guys still are. Um, I feel like any time when I was at Siena, um, summertime, wherever, if one person was in town, sure enough, you know, Finland was here. You know, three other people would pop up. Yeah, at sure. Like, you guys move collectively as a group. And I think that's awesome, especially, you know, 10 years removed now, you guys are still that close. You know, do you do you keep up with any of your former teammates? You know, do you? I know you go to a lot of weddings and when, whenever you can. Uh, so do you, you yeah, keep up I mean, with you guys? Yeah, I think uh, you know. Obviously, we have a couple group chats going on. Uh, certain people in some, certain people in others. But uh, the guys that are still playing, I'm still following them. The guys that aren't still playing are all doing really well in their life. Um, but yeah, I think. It was like again, going back to it, we were friends. We were friends before we were teammates. I think you can just be teammates with someone and play hard, and at the end of the day, you're going to go your separate ways. But we were all friends before that, friends after that. So, like you said, we're still going to weddings. We're still talking to each other every time. As Ryan said, if someone's in Albany, it's oh, I'm going to try to get up there. Then, all right, are you playing today? All right, I'm definitely going to come. So you really love to see that. Um, you know, you'll be in the gym. I remember last year I was playing pickup, or two summers ago I was playing pickup. Jimmy Halley came in just to come say what's up because me and Ron were playing. Kenny's always up there. So it's, it's fun because the older you get, the more you talk to guys overseas and you ask them, oh, what, what are your guys from so-and-so doing? And they're like, I don't know. I don't really talk to them. You see how kind of rare it is that not every team is like that. Not every team still stays close and still has that bond. Yeah, no, and I felt like you had that bond not only with your teammates but with staff there. I mean, you mentioned your relationship with, with Dan Taylor. I know every time you come out, you and him, Boogie, uh, Hammer, the trainer, would obviously get into it and, and joke around and get treatment. But but also um, the saga workers, I feel like every time you were in town, they they really – they would come to me like, hey, do you hear rosters here? Like, you stopped by and, like, you know, it just made their day. Talk about how, you know, your relationship with those with those people. Yeah, I mean, I'm a I'm a pretty outgoing person. Um, I try to always say hello to to whoever um, uh, to whoever I see, no matter no matter who it is. And I think um, you know, those are the people that make campuses special and make school special. Um, you know, you have a guy like like John Darginio, who's I think a phenomenal AD, great guy, but everyone knows him because he's the AD. 
and he's, he's also a great person, but it's easy to know a guy like that. But then do you know the guys, that the, the guys that are cooking your food at Saga, the custodians that clean the locker rooms? It's those guys that don't really get thanks, but they're just great guys that work hard. And, and the women in the, in the staff that always greet you with a smile. Um, so I've always tried to make a point to become friends with them and learn a little bit about them. Obviously, like you said, Hammer's my guy as well. All the training staff, they do so much for you that – it's not, I don't think it should be like a, uh, not a boss employee relationship, but it should just be a friendly, friendly kind of thing. And I've always just been that way where I'll have a 25 minute conversation with someone in Saga just because and then Tyrone's up there going crazy. So it's, uh, they're just a bunch of characters and they're good people. Talk a little, talk a little bit. Obviously, this is I'm a little biased, but talk a little bit about your relationship with the walk-ons at Siena. You know, I know you were my biggest fan, no doubt about it. And when when a young guy like Stephen Cruz came along, I know you really took him under your wing too. But you know, not I'm not saying not everyone does that. But what what was it about the walk-ons that really made you want to you know take care of them? Um, I think it's it takes a lot to to go on a team knowing you're never, ever going to play, ever. Maybe you get 30 seconds in a game, like maybe. And to still show up every day and want to be part of it and want to rebound and want to want to do things the right way, I think you kind of have to know your place, but you're still part of the team where it's like, look, man, I know I'm not going to get the same treatment Kenny Hasbrook gets, and I don't think I deserve the same treatment Kenny Hasbrook gets. I just enjoy basketball. I enjoy the team. I enjoy that. So I think there's a, uh, a great deal of respect that should be given to that. And a guy like you and Steve, where you guys just wanted to show up every day, do whatever you could to help, um, watch the game as a coach almost. And obviously me and you would do it a lot where I'd be playing a game in the game and I'm 35 minutes into the game. And during a timeout, you might be like, so-and-so's tired, man. I'm telling you, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, all right, I'll do it. And then next time it works because you would watch the game like that. You weren't just there to hang out and, put a uniform on you were there to be into the game and watch the game dissect the game um and yeah you and Cruz are just such good guys Cruz was obviously my biggest fan since sophomore year of high school um you know he wrote me a nice uh Facebook message his sophomore or junior year of high school I didn't see it until my senior year when he was a freshman sitting with me in Saga so you could ask him about that um it was really nice just a sweet innocent kid from uh Washington Heights re- reaching out to his favorite Seattle basketball player. Nah, definitely, definitely. I feel like um, you know the the walk ons really make the experience whole. Um, yep. In my time there, built a great relationship with a couple of those walk ons, and even to this day, you know, we're still very close. Um, talk about what was your probably your best or your favorite memory um, in a Seattle jersey. <laughs> Um, that's your favorite. I don't know. I mean, obviously Ohio State was great. Um, I think the Niagara championship game was really fun. Um, we started off pretty poorly, um, but the energy was, was insane. And I, I kind of wish Sharon was on the podcast after me. Because fun fact, now that we're 10 years removed, obviously Facebook was the thing at that point in our lives. So inviting people to parties via Facebook was the thing. So <laughs> as you guys brought it up last, last week, Ron was good friends with a bunch of Niagara guys. So they were Facebook friends as well. And before we played the championship, Ron sent out a Facebook post-game championship party invite <laughs> to all the Siena students. And he included the Niagara guys on that invite. So at about 1 p.m. on championship day, he, they get a notification that says Ronald Moore would like to invite you to the Siena men's basketball post-game party. And, uh, you know, that's just kind of the, the swag and confidence Ron had and kind of brought to our team. And I think you can – sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. But I think, as we talked about earlier, we backed that up every day in practice by competing and working hard where it wasn't a false sense of confidence. It, was, it wasn't cockiness either because Coach Mack's quote is never get too high, never get too low. To stay in the middle. So I'm not saying that's the right way to go about things, but Ron, uh, Ron definitely gave us, would always give us that little edge and uh, invited them to a post-game party that we were playing them in. I might, uh, I might be a little biased, but 
I don't know if anyone had a bigger transformation from freshman year coming in to senior year that you did. You know, obviously you came in, you talked about the struggles you had, but ended up winning Mac player of the year on, you know, not under 500 team. What, what was that transformation like personally for you? I know you're not about, you know, you're not about personal things, but what, what did it mean to you, you know, to see where you started to where you ended? Um, I think I never lost confidence. I always knew I could play, like I said earlier, with skill. I always knew my skill was there. Um, so I realized I didn't do enough in the weight room or conditioning before I got to Siena. But, I, you know, I knew that was something that I could fix. It wasn't like I didn't know the game or I didn't know how to play or couldn't shoot. I just needed to get in the weight room. Um, so, again, the day we lost to Villanova, we flew back that day. The next morning we got to campus. I would already talked to Dan. I said, I'm coming into Lyft. I'll be there at 10 a.m. Dan's like, hey, you know, just make sure your body's okay. And uh, Coach Chaskin, who I appreciate at the time, at the time I didn't, but now I understand he was just looking out for my best interest and trying to make sure I was uh, healthy and had three good more years of me. But he wouldn't let me lift. He was, me and him were getting into fights every day that I have to take my two weeks off, I have to get my body together. I told him, I was like, Coach, I, I understand, but I played three minutes this weekend in the NCAA tournament. I'm fine. I'm there's no lagging injury. I'm not Kenny. I'm not Alex. I'm not Ron who played 35 minutes. I'm going into lift and I could either sneak in at 6 PM or I could do it now. And he just wouldn't let me lift. So I would have to go either really early or really late. Um, Dan may or may not have left the weight room open for me so I could go in alone. Um, and again, I know coach Jessica was just looking out for my best interest, but uh, at that point I wasn't going to have another year like I did my freshman year. So from the day after Villanova, like it was on, I'm getting in the weight room, I'm getting, I'm eating everything I can, I'm running, I'm doing everything I can to uh, get my career to where I want it to be. And you, I mean, obviously your career is still going, you know, you know, 12 years later, 11 years later. Um, where did you kind of get that mindset of, you know, now, you know, being a true professional where you know how to carry yourself on and off the court. You're about the weight room, getting in time in on the court, skill stuff. Where did that kind of mindset really develop from? Um, I think I try to add a little bit every year to whether it's a change in diet or a change in the workouts. Um, I always thought I worked pretty hard at Siena and after Siena. And now looking back, I'm like, man, I could have did way more. I could have did this, could have did that. So that's kind of my attitude. But then, like I said earlier, you, you got to realize – you have to make a choice when you play. Are you going to do this for two or three years and just play overseas, or are you going to make this a career? And my attitude has always been, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it 100%. I don't want to just play and play at 70% of my best. I'm going to make sure I'm doing everything on the court, off the court, to keep my body right, to be healthy, to eat right, so I can get 100% out of it. So if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. Um, and, yeah, to get those workouts in in the summer, to get things done in the off season, you have to make that – that shift that you're not a basketball player from August to March or to May, you're a basketball player year round. So you don't have to be in the gym every single day in the summer, but you have to make sure you're doing stuff every day to kind of get better and keep the maintenance. Um, so your body is okay for the upcoming season. And you realize it's just a job. You get paid to be in the gym and to be in the weight room. So you do it. You know, yeah, obviously your first three years, you're, you got the NCAA tournament, you know, Mac champions, Coach Mack leaves, um, as you talked about earlier, you know, he, he did tell you he was honest, honest from the get go. But was there anything, you know, mentally or personal that you wanted to, you know, that you didn't do in your first three years that you, you obviously want to do in your senior year? And, you know, being the man is one I know, you know, you were the, you were the go to guy your senior year, but the season didn't go the way you wanted it. So was there anything like mentally to get you, you know, to finish your career at Siena? No, I mean, looking back, there's a lot of stuff I would have done differently. Um, now, just with all my experience playing overseas and then relating to guys from other cultures and other parts of the world, I don't think I did a good enough job my senior year being a captain and relating to guys. I think the first three years, we had such an easy team from with leadership. Um, we had a lot of similar guys. And then senior year, we my senior year, we had a bunch of different guys, sometimes a little bit of different agendas which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I think I needed to do a better job relating to them and not just trying to preach, this is what we did the last three years, so it's going to work, so we have to do it again this year. I should have tried to understand them a little more and understand why they didn't want to do this or why they felt the way they did, and I didn't do a good enough job of that. 
Um, so that's kind of like my one big regret from Siena where I always felt like I played as hard as I could. Um, I felt like I gave my body and my effort every night, no matter what. But I think in terms of leadership or relating to the other guys, I could have did a better job um, than I did. So I've always kind of had that hanging over me. No, nah, for sure. For sure. And what would you say, you know, to the opposite way on the positive side, like, what lessons did you learn from Sienna that you still use like on, on a day-to-day -day basis today? Um, just have fun with, with basketball. I think uh, if you don't, you know, if you're not having fun with it, Coach Mack, I remember we, we played at St. Peter's, I think it was my junior year, and we were 13-0 and in the conference at that point, or 12-0. and We got on the bus, and St. Peter's at the time was, you know, ninth, 10th place team, weren't, weren't very good. We knew we were going to win. Um, I think it was my sophomore year, actually. Get on the bus. We're, we're rolling in the conference. We're fine. And then uh, we just got on the bus and got the food and sat there. Coach Mack was the last one on the bus because he immediately comes on the bus and he's like, he's like, what's going on? And we're all like, what do we do? We just won. Why are we in trouble? And he yelled at us for not enjoying the victory. And, you know, there's a difference between rubbing it in or celebrating on the court. But on the bus, everyone was just like – all right, how many more of these we got left till the tournament? And he, he literally got on the bus and yelled at us to enjoy each victory. There's no victory that's guaranteed. There's no game that's less than the other games. And I've always kind of stuck with me that you still have to win. Even if you're supposed to win, it still takes a lot to go win a basketball game. So you have to still enjoy that. You have to enjoy the whole process and you have to enjoy everything. Um, so I think it's rare for a coach to, to yell at you for not being happy after you win a game. But that, that's Coach Mack. He he wanted he wanted everyone to you know take the take the culture as he did. But exactly. uh, talk, talk a little bit about you know the rebounding aspect of your game. Uh, you know from from where you were freshman year, I think you went up like almost twelve rebounds a game in average from where you started freshman year. And you know a lot of Siena fans know that you and Alex Franklin used to battle. You know who was going to get the rebounds, and then once Alex left, then it was Odie coming in and you battling who's going to get the rebounds. So. What was it about, you know, attacking, attacking rebounds that you wanted to do personally so much? That was the only way I was going to play. Um, I mean, look at the, the guys in front of me. Uh, look at the, the one through four spots. Ronald Moore, best passer. Him and Mark in the history of Siena, who could also score. Kenny Hasbrook, one of the best scorers ever to play. Talented. Edwin, probably the most talented player to ever play. Alex, great post scorer, great athlete. Clarence coming off the bench to shoot. Tay can shoot. We had a lot of guys that could score and could score better than I could. So the only way I was going to play is if I ran the court as hard as I could every time and if I went after every single rebound. Um, and I learned that pretty quickly. So once, once I kind of saw the writing on the wall that it's like your job's going to be to run the court, to outlet the ball as quickly as possible, whether it's a make or miss and rebound, I'll play, you know, X number of minutes. And I wound up, I think, leading the team in minutes a few a few seasons because all I would do is, you know, rebound and run. And Ron's an easy guy to play with because you're open, he's getting you the ball. Kenny and Ed take so much attention on the wing spots. No one's going to double you because they're not leaving them. And Alex would be the one to get double teamed. So I, I would just – half the time I'd just stand there like this under the hoop, catch and lay it in. And it was a cheap two points. But uh, I think I found my role. Coach Mack was very clear with my role, and I embraced it. Um, and then rebounding kind of is a passion for me um, personally. And I think if you could get, you get that backbreaking rebound where it's a three point game, the other team gets the stop, but then you get the offensive rebound, kick it back out. Now they have to foul. I think those are just demoralizing plays. Um, so I've always just went at the offensive glass really hard. Yeah, I, I love that when you're talking about your dad, teaching your brother and yourself how to play. The first thing you said he taught you was boxing out. Yep. Is and maybe I'm reading too much into it, but do you watch on games where the ball typically goes from when it's, shoot, when it's shot on one side of the court to be the other? Or no, I do. Um, I mean, I would watch – I'd watch our teammates. Um, you know, Downey kind of has a bit of like a push shot. So his, he usually had pretty soft misses that if he missed, he usually missed soft. So it would go front rim, back rim, rim and drop. Um, Ron kind of has a slingshot like I do. So Ron tends to have long misses. So I would study who's shooting and, and how their misses usually come, what type of shot they're taking. If Kenny took his little runner, that's probably going to miss pretty soft so I could get right under the hoop. Um, 
if it's someone coming out for a deep three, it's probably going to kick if they miss. So get into a position like that. So I would pay a lot of attention to who was shooting and how they missed um, and try to understand the positioning of it um, and just put myself in the right spot. I think a lot of guys wait to see where the ball goes so they can go get it. But if you can duck in, a lot of guys, once someone shoots, they put their head up. Right at that moment, if you slide in and you're on offense and you box out the defender, you just gave yourself six, seven extra feet to get that rebound. Um, so I put a lot of time into it and a lot of kind of studying the angles and seeing where guys were going to miss. That's awesome. A lot, lost art of the game, to be honest, you know. And that's why you were part of the Rebound Supreme. Uh, I think that's what it's called, right? Team Rebound Supreme. <laughs> Team Rebound Supreme. You and Alex Franklin. But um, – of all, of all the accolades you've gotten, player of the year, rebounding, leading the country, you were awarded, which a lot of people don't know, student of the year at Siena <laughs> your senior year. Um, and we, were, we talked a lot about, you know, how you handled yourself on campus. You talked to everyone no matter what position they were at. So what did that award mean to you coming from your academic side and knowing that you were voted, that was voted off, you know, your professors and, and, the, and everyone on, the, on campus? It was funny. At the time, I didn't even know what it, I did. Clarence actually told me Clarence was like hey congrats on student of the year and I thought he was talking about student athlete of the year because he wasn't at the awards the, the student awards so I was like yeah you you already said that and he's like no student of the year and I don't know what he's talking about so I had to go find an email he sent me and it was this the list um and I thought it was a mistake at first to be honest and I had to go to a uh, ceremony before graduation my parents came and I felt a little out of place because you get the award, but before it, it's like excellence in mathematics with a 4.7 GPA, so-and-so, excellence in science. Um, the I forgot his name, but the, the guy going before me was in the ROTC and was literally going to Iraq the next week to fight the war. And he's getting an award for that. And then I'm the next person to go to get a student of the year award after that guy. And it's like, this is, this is tough. Um, and then I kind of, they read the award and I, I understood it more. It said, uh, you know, it's who embodies a Sienna student and a, the character of a Sienna person. It's like, all right, makes sense. I always try to be nice and I always try to enjoy myself on campus, but, you know, be respectful, say to security guards, say to everyone. So it was a fun little, uh, little award, icing on the cake, I guess, to end my uh, Sienna tenure. Nah, that's, uh, that, that's awesome. And it says a lot about you as a person. Um, you know, I feel like everywhere you've gone, you've kind of made that impact. And, uh, you know, even, again, when you were coming to summertime, like, I always felt that way. And really appreciate you because, you know, you, is, you know, that's really who you are. It's not like you've been on the front. So I definitely appreciate that for sure. Yeah, I think I always had good guys to look up to. Um, when I was at Siena and a lot of the older guys that had played weren't really up there when I was there. Um, so, I mean, I mean, I'm even talking Tay and Kenny as people to look up to. And they were my teammates. Um, and I remember when Kenny would come back and work out with us and he's training for the heat and overseas, Kenny would be there. And I always felt like there was a different energy because even though he's my teammate and he's my friend, the younger guys, even just a freshman, a year younger, may not really know Kenny. And it's like, that guy's good, man. Like, what, who did he play? And I'm like, he played last year, man. And you, you kind of learn the history. Um, and I had the chance to play uh, Mark Brown in summer league when I was 17. And I just remember playing this game, Jersey Shore Summer League, and every time I'd score or do something, I would just hear this guy on the other team say, all right, I see you, Sienna. Nice move, Sienna. And I didn't know who Mark was at the time. And I'm like, why does this guy keep – like, I, I mean, I've known going to Sienna, but why does he know that? And after the game, he came up to me. And he's like, hey, man, I'm Mark Brown. I played at Sienna. I know you're going there. I just want to introduce myself. So I went home and looked up Mark Brown after that. And I was like, this guy's the best player to ever play at Sienna. And he's just, like, treating me like I was something important to go to Sienna. And I learned the history. I saw him again next week at the league. And I was like, man, I didn't know. I'm like, sorry, I didn't know who you were. And he's like, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. If you ever need anything, let me know. And that was my first intro to Mark. Um, but, yeah, I always thought after that it's really important to kind of learn the history and, and be around for the younger guys. Um, I wish the last two years I haven't been able to be up as much. But like you said, I always enjoy coming up in the summer to play pickup, to help guys with anything they need, um, and just kind of – just be there because I've been through everything you guys are going through and it should still be your experience and, and make your own decisions. But if anyone ever wants to ask me anything or do anything, I'm more than happy to help.
Oh, it's, it's special. Uh, one last question, and we'll get some quick hitters from you. But uh, you're talking about, you know, guys looking up to you. Not a lot of people know, but you obviously wore 22 at Siena. That was your number. Um, Coach McCaffrey, Patrick McCaffrey now wears 22 because of you, which is obviously an honor. But what, what does it mean to have guys like, like that looking up to you? I think you, you realize when you see something like that, obviously we're always friends. All of us were friends with Connor and Patrick and, you know, their kids are always running around and they're always crazy and we're 10 years older than them. Um, so you're just playing with the kids, just shooting around one day. And then you see something like that. And I really, I realized following just an AAU that he always wore 22. And then I saw him get to Iowa and he wears 22. And then he does an article about why he wears 22. And you kind of realize the impact you have on, on kids and on people that you don't even realize you're having. Um, and, you know, they remember all that stuff. And it's the same stuff we all remember as kids when any of us were in an open gym at 10 years old. You watch a guy that you didn't even know who he was, but you think he's the best player in the world just because you maybe see him dunk once and he becomes your hero. And it's like that guy didn't even play college basketball, but you just remember him because he meant something to you as a kid. So something like that means a lot to me. And, um, you know, I'm still close with Connor and Patrick. We still talk a lot. Um, but, uh, yeah, something like that where it's just just being friendly to uh, a kid playing basketball and all of a sudden he wants to wear your number for the rest of his career uh, really means a lot to you and kind of opens your eyes to how much of an impact you can make. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, we'll go to our quick hitters. Um, what would you say your favorite food is? Um, one in general, then, but your favorite food in Japan as well. Favorite food by far is pizza. No, no second, no third. It's pizza. Um, in terms of like a Japanese specific food, um, they have like a certain style of sweet potato that I really like. Um, I eat that daily. That would be my Japanese food. But other than that, pizza. Shout out to Fazio's. Um, Always looking it up. Great pie. Go there. <laughs> Thank you, Mikey. This is sponsorships. We really appreciate that. Indeed but, um, you know, a lot of people that know you personally know you're a movie guru. So this might, you might not only give me one, but what, what would you say your favorite movie is? True story. It's Magic Mike XXL. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like it's the best movie ever made. I could go on for hours. I could debate you on it, but that's the best movie ever made. Did you know that Channon Tatum's from Tampa, Florida? I didn't know he was actually from there, but. He went to my rival, Tampa Catholic High School, went to my rival. Yeah, it's Little, little World. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you said you had, um, you know, a lot of time um, overseas, free time. Are you able to, to binge watch and kind of get into any uh, shows over there? Yeah, way too much. Um, Obviously, there hasn't been much new in terms of shows because everything was delayed and shut down. But it's it's almost bad because I'll finish like a Stranger Things in one day, and it's like I have nothing to do now because I just have that kind of time. Sometimes if it's like Sunday night after a game into a Monday off day, I'll have ten episodes of a new season or something, and I'm done by Monday like afternoon. So how different is the Japan Netflix from the American Netflix? Um, it's a little different. All the originals, you still get the same catalog pretty much. It's just more so like the, some of the show licensings aren't the same. So you won't get like the office over here just cause they don't have a licensing agreement, but, um, it's, it's almost the same thing. Uh, what, what would you say your favorite basketball shoes are to wear or right now? Kyrie six by far. Did you buy Tim Pair? A rumor, you know, Kyder said last episode that, you know, you, you, you would be found to, to buy 10 pairs of one shoe that you love. If it's not broke, don't fix it, man. I think I have eight in the other room right now. Um, it's more so, it happened more so because I'm, I'm a size 17. So it's, it's hard to get a shoe that you like. I'm pretty picky with colors. Um, I've eased up a little bit, but I, I can't wear a black shoe. I don't like. I, I can't wear like a red shoe with the Sienna colors. Like I just don't like the mix of that. Um, so it's hard to find a size and style you want when you're a size 17. Um, so if I find one or two that I like, I'll order like five at a time just so I have them. Uh, that makes sense. That definitely makes sense. Um, so you're in a capital region, you're hungry. What's your, what, what, what food spot are you going to go to? I already said it, the Fazio's. <laughs> They're adding a bunch of desserts to the menu that I keep seeing Matt put up on Instagram that 
is going to get me in trouble. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he's added some cheesecakes and stuff. But I think a, a pie from DeFazio's is just – you can't beat it. That's a, that's a great choice. What would you say um, the best advice Coach Mack has ever given you? Probably the, the most – the one I could put to use pretty quick. I remember my freshman year, we were playing a game at the Times Union. I, I messed something up, and I punched the floor. And I didn't, I didn't like – I didn't really hit it that hard, but I made a fist and I punched it. And I just did one of these after. And he lit me up. And it was all about, like, break your hand. You miss four to six weeks. Hurt the team. Hurt yourself. And I didn't even get hurt. I never even – like, I didn't have to go to trainer. But he just put, like, a shock into me that was like, yeah, that is pretty stupid to, to get angry at myself for making a play, not making a play, and then break my hand. And he didn't waste a second. Like, he just went at me. And it, I've always thought of it after that, that it's like, all right, no matter what happens, maybe slap, like, a – padded surface but don't punch the court and be out six weeks no, that's definitely good advice uh, who would you say is the best player you you ever played against the most helpless I ever felt when I thought I was like a decent player we played at Pitt my sophomore year and um, I guarded Dewan Blair and that was like that was a really good Pitt team and we had a good Siena team I mean that was Alex Kenny um, quick version, but the funny story of that game was we were playing Pitt. They were ranked. Um, so before the game in the locker room, Coach Mack has talked to everyone. He's given us the speech, and he's like, he's like, look, I don't care who they have on that team. Ronald Moore, I'll take you over Levance Fields any day. You're the lead the nation in assists. You're the best passer in the league. No questions asked. Kenny Hasbrook, you're a pro. Forget Gilbert Brown. Um, Edwin Ubelis, you got more talent in your pinky than uh, – I forgot his name. Uh, Brad Wanamaker, who's with the Boston, I think, right now, mm-hmm. has going and hyping everyone. Alex Franklin, I'll take you over uh, Tyrell Biggs. Tyrell Biggs? Sam Young. Yeah. Any day. I'll take you any day. And as he's going, I kind of see the writing on the wall. I'm like, how are you going to spin this to say that I'm better than Dewan Blair? And he just gets to me. And it's the reason I love Coach Mack. He just gets to me and he's like, Ryan Rossiter, I'm not going to lie to you. You got a tough one tonight. And just like, he didn't try to say, he didn't try to lie to me and tell me I was better than him or I was going to stop him. He's just like, just wrestle him the best you can and uh, we'll help you out. And I was like, all right. We all just started laughing after that and kind of easy. Granted, we got blown out that night. But uh, he was so strong and hard to move that like I was given everything I could to box him out. And it was like demoralizing because he's basically telling me, he's like, you're not going to move me. And I'm, like, th- trying to three-quarter and box out. He's like, no, nah, I'm going to get this rebound. And he would just get it. Like, he was just so strong that I just – I had nothing to do for him, man. I just looked at Coach Mack and I was like, I'm trying, but this isn't going to go well for us. <laughs> so, we, uh, we, have a, we have a weekly fan write-in question. This was uh, texted to me by a former teammate of yours, Owen Wignott. Um, he wants <laughs> – he w- was interested to know if you've ever been dunked on before. I mean, I definitely have. If so, if so, what was the worst he, he wanted to know? Um, I was brought up to – I forgot about it, but it was probably uh, Georgia Tech um, senior year. Uh, Eamon Schumpert, he had a putback on me. And I'll say what I said at the time and what I said in the Siena Zoom talk a few months ago or last month. If anyone on the team boxed out, I wouldn't have been dunked on because I had to box out my guy – and then the rebound came off, and I went to go get it. So I jumped to go get it. Shumpert had a straight line run because no one boxed him out from the three-point line. Put his left arm on my neck, just caught it and just all over me. I, like, went down like this. Um, but we won, so at the end of the day, <laughs> you know, we won the war. I won the battle. But uh, that was probably the worst. Um, there's plenty others. I mean, when you just – do the fence defense, you're going to get caught a few times. Uh, that one's probably the one that comes to mind most. I don't know who else. Yeah, I think that would probably be the worst one. <laughs> okay. Nah, I mean, it's a famous quote. If you play enough, you play basketball long enough, you know, it's going to happen at some point. If you haven't, you haven't played at a high enough level. Exactly. Exactly. Um, who's someone, you know, growing up or even now that you've tried to model your game after? 
probably Dirk. Um, Dirk growing up the most with kind of the fadeaway and, and shots and ability to do different things on the court. Um, then over time, just started to try to take different things from different people's games. Um, um, work on kind of a Euro step from Ginobili, different types of things. Garnett was another one when I was young. Um, so now it's more so just see something I like, whether it's, you know, me and Kenny get in the gym a lot in the summer and they'll ask me to teach him a fadeaway and I'll, I'll have him teaching me different guard footwork and just ways to work on different things together. Um, so I think you can learn a lot from different people's games, not necessarily just someone that's in the NBA. Absolutely. Who, uh, if, if there's one Siena player you could play with that you didn't, who would it be? I'm, I won't say Mark because that's the easy answer and Ron took it last week. <laughs> you know, Ron would have been on the bench. Um, <laughs> I might say Jalen, to be honest. Uh, I've watched him a lot. I've thought that we talk a lot, worked out with him in the summer. Um, and I, I just – I like the way he plays. I like the, the intensity he plays with. And he just kind of always looks like he's having fun out there. So I think probably him, hopefully I'd get to wear 22. But at this point, it's not looking too good. <laughs> might, be, might be his number. So I don't know. Might have to put a, you know, a roster slash pick it up in the TU. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, two at this point. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, all right. Day before the game or day of the game in the morning, what what pregame rituals or superstitions, if you have any, that that you have to do? I don't really have any. Um, I pretty much do the same stuff daily before practice and eat the same stuff regardless. Um, so in the game, I, the game I try to always do what I'm doing anyway. Um, but the older I've got, whether it's like a shooting routine or so and so routine, it's hit or miss with the gym time sometimes where we might have access to the court 16 minutes before the game or another team does their warm up different where you have access 15 minutes before the game. And I kind of realized it after I listened to a JJ Reddick podcast a while ago, that stuff, man, if you're so set in routines and then you don't get to do your routine, then it's detrimental to, to you. Cause in your head, it's like, oh, I didn't get my 35 makes up. I'm not a good shooter anymore. Meanwhile, it means nothing. And I remember Reddick saying that where on the road, sometimes that, the gyms are different. The teams are different. So he can't do his same routine. And that used to really mess with him. And he would feel like he wasn't a shooter anymore, even though he's one of the best to ever do it. Um, so I kind of tried to purposely get myself out of routines for the off chance that one day someone says, hey, we only get on the court from an hour before the game. And we don't get on the court again until 11 minutes. You have to change everything you do. So now I've just kind of learned how to like roll with it. And all right, I'll have this for 20 minutes. All right, I'll do this. And that's kind of put my mind at ease before games or I never feel like, oh, I'm not ready because I didn't do my 10 stretches and my 10 free throws and this. It's like, just go out and play, man. You've been playing your whole life. You work out every day. Um, just get out of your own head. That's uh, what Ray Allen was known for. He would be shooting with the dancers, you know, still yeah. practicing, but he would definitely get his, still get his shots up and never, never stopped him. But you do that uh, every day when you're him. You can't do that. Yeah, I know. I know. It's a little different. <laughs> it's a little different. I'm sure. I'm sure. But, what would, uh, what would you say the best part about playing the Times Union Center was? I mean, the fans obviously make it, give it the energy, but it just got such a big time feel. Um, I mean, the reality is you go to a place like Marist, you go to St. Peter's, you go somewhere like that, you don't feel like it's like big time basketball. You come into the Times Union and other teams feel the same way. You're in a legit professional arena um the locker rooms the feel of it the vibe the noise the music it's big time basketball especially when that place is rocking um you have eight nine thousand people in there it, it feels like a real event not just a, a small college basketball game that's real man that's that's one of the best feelings when it when it's yeah you, i mean you guys know it you come out you see all the yellow shirts you see that the band starts going the energy it's like what you watched as a kid on tv it's not – again, yeah. I don't mean to keep ripping St. Peter's here because they had a good year, <laughs> but it's not St. Peter's where you have to, like, really get yourself up for it. Yes. Sorry, Cruz. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, you know, again, we're, we're still new to the podcast game and we're enjoying it. We've had, you know, two wonderful guests on with, with Ronald and, and second yourself. 
Um, drop a name of someone, anyone affiliated with Sienna Basketball that you love to see as a guest on our pod. Ron said Kenny. I mean, I, I think, you know, if you get the older guys, that'd be great. You get Mark, you get some of those guys. But I think a real good perspective would honestly be Corey. Corey knew the history of Sienna a lot, played really hard, had a bunch of uh, – different viewpoints from it from going and being an active player to, to all the, everything he dealt with off the court and concussions and whatnot on the court so I think he'd be a really good conversation to have well now he will be on the list about to say, we're on the list and we got to get the Fazios to uh, sponsor the podcast we're, we're working on that we're we're, all, we're in we're in negotiations right now <laughs> Did you, send one? you sent a dm yeah <laughs> I haven't seen him at the farmer's market, but next time I see him, I'll say something. <laughs> but uh, what, what's some, I, I know you're, you know, you're on Instagram and stuff. What's, what's something that the Sienna fans can, uh, can follow you on? Um, I mean, I don't post too much, but Instagram is just Ryan Rossiter. Um, and that's really it. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm there. It's, uh, it's, like you said, I don't really post much about myself or, or basketball highlights. So I'm, I'm sorry if that disappoints some people but that's just not who I am. Nah, no worries at all. We'll, we'll, we'll do all the posting for you. Don't worry. All right, that's even better then. <laughs> any, any meaning behind your tattoo on your, on your wrist? Well, the new one or the old one? I didn't know you had two. I thought it was just the one, I, the little, uh, looks like a sun, I think. Well, this, oh, okay. is, this one know. is Japanese. This is hiragana. It says okay. Ima Koko, which means now here. Um, it's a Japanese poem that I read in this Japanese book I was reading. Um, and I just kind of liked it. It's just to enjoy the, the now and the here is the meaning and just enjoy the moment, whether it's good or bad. Um, especially something like this, where there's going to be a lot of downtime, a lot of bad times, but just embrace it and uh, kind of know what's going on. Um, and then this one really has no meaning whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> it's literally me and my brother two weeks ago, he had made a, playlist on spotify about this he's like i'll get this as a tattoo and i was like set the appointment let's do it <laughs> uh, we went in friday night saturday afternoon we had the tattoos oh wow and that was it so what so i'm guessing the one the letters is the one that gets on wine bottles or is it the other one yeah that's uh <laughs> i was like 99 percent sure I, I wanted to get it um and then i did a little more research on the poet and he was actually born in toshigi which is like the the city it's called a prefecture um that i live in here and that's who i played for play for to she breaths now it's in amia so i was like well i guess that's a sign where i kind of have to do it now um uh, but yeah that i got last summer and this two weeks ago one has some deep meaning the other one was like all right we got nothing to do let's go yeah that's awesome do you have any any, la any last things to say to the Sienna faithful? Uh, you know, obviously with a season upcoming or anything you'd like to say? I think uh, we're in a good spot for the uh, next few years. Um, obviously, I think Carm's done a phenomenal job kind of getting the energy back. And as he said, and we all know, he's a Sienna guy through and through. So he, he really cares about it. Um, I think there's a really talented team coming in. I feel like we've added like 14 players because I can't <laughs> keep up. Every day there's a new number reveal. <laughs> we're gonna start going to triple digits soon so I don't really get how many people are on this roster but uh I think we're headed in the direction to get back to the real exciting days of Siena basketball so uh just keep supporting and uh Carm's got it Word, words words from the great Ryan Rosser thanks again for joining us Ryan really appreciate it episode two will be up soon make sure you don't forget to subscribe on wherever you listen to podcasts we also have a YouTube channel and all you can follow all our social media is at side underscore stories pod. Uh, we really appreciate it, Ryan. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. For Ryan. sure. Thanks, guys.